श्रीमद सदगुरु सखाद की राधे राधे गोविंद गोविंद राधे 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 Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare 
राधा कृष्ण भगवान की राधे राधे टू एवरीबॉडी प्रपन्न सदा श्याम गुरु पाद तस्य प्रेरणया दिव्या वदाम्यह करविंदेन पदारविंद मुखारविंदे विनिवेशय वट से पत्र से पुटे शयानम बालम मुकुंदम मन सामी चे तो दर्पण मजन भव दावाग्निर्वापण 
ಶ್ರೇಯ ಕೈರವಚಂದ್ರಿಕಾತರಣ ವಿಧೂಜೀವನ ಆನಂದಾಂಬುಧಿವರ್ಧನ ಪ್ರತಿಪದ ಪೂರ್ಣಾಮೃತ ಸ್ವಾದನ ಸರ್ವಾತ್ಮಸ್ನಪನ ಪರಂ ವಿಜಯತೆ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಣಿ ಪೂರ್ವ ಯೋ ವೈ ವೇದಾಂಶ ಪ್ರಹಿಣೋತಿ ತಸ್ಮೈ ತಗ್ವಂಹ ದೇವಮಾತ್ಮಬುಧಿ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ ಮುಕ್ಷುರ್ವೈ ಶರಣಮಹಂ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೆ the divine souls we'll have a few minutes of naam sankirtan and then we'll continue with this discussion of shrimad bhagavat mahapuran so please join me in singing the divine names of radha krishna ರಾಧೆ ರಾಧೆ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಗೋವಿಂದ ರಾಧೆ 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 ಗೋವಿಂದ ಗೋವಿಂದ ರಾಧೆ ರಾಧೆ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಗೋವಿಂದ ರಾಧೆ ರಾಧೆ ರಾ 
राधे गोविंद गोविंद राधे राधे गोविंद गोविंद राधे
We'll continue with some practical devotional guidelines that we can learn from the Bhagavatam. So as we've done the last couple of nights, I'll share some of the practical aspects of devotion that the Bhagavatam teaches us. We'll do some Rup Dhyan, <clears throat> then I'll get into a little bit of the technical philosophy of Bhagavatam and share a little bit of Leela of Bhagavatam with you to finish. When King Parikshit heard the description of Aghasur, Aghasur was a demon who had come to kill Sri Krishna and the Gwalbals. So he took the form of a great snake, a huge snake that was so big, his mouth looked like a cave. So you couldn't even tell he was a snake. <laughs> Krishna and the Gwalbals were out walking and he just went right in the path where they would see him and he opened his mouth. So it looked like there was this very interesting cave right there where there didn't used to be one. And the Gwalbals, being young boys and curious by nature, of course they wanted to go and explore inside the cave. So they went in and Aghasur was so poisonous that just by entering into his mouth, they were killed by the poison of Aghasur. Shri Krishna knew what was going on and he went in Aghasur's mouth and now Aghasur had accomplished his objective which was really to kill Shri Krishna. He had him in his mouth so he closed his mouth. But then Shri Krishna just made himself get taller and taller and taller and taller until he broke out of the top of Aghasur. And Aghasur was killed and Shri Krishna brought all of his friends back to life. But at the end of the story, we learn that Aghasur entered into Shri Krishna's abode. He attained Shri Krishna. So Parikshit was wondering, how is it possible that someone like Aghasur was able to attain Shri Krishna when he had come with the intention of killing him? So Shukadev ji explained, Sakridya danga prati Mantarahita mano mai bhagavatim dadau gatim. He said, Parikshit, think about this. He gave him a comparison. He said, Shri Krishna physically entered into the mouth of Aghasur. His feet touched Aghasur. Now compare that with the souls of the world who meditate on Shri Krishna. He says, Mano Mai. When we meditate on Shri Krishna, what we call Rup Dhyan. Jagadguru Shri Kripaluji Maharaj always emphasized that the most important aspect of devotion is remembering God or meditating on God. And the best way to do that is Rup Dhyan. Rup means the form. So here, Shukadevji is saying, Mano Mai, Man is your mind. 
and manomai means something made of your mind so you make a shri krishna in your mind when you're meditating shukdev ji says souls can attain shri krishna with their manomai shri krishna they make shri krishna in their mind and they get a connection with him like that and they're able to attain him so then why does it seem strange to you that aghasur would get to go to the divine world when shri krishna physically entered into his mouth then parikshit understood but the point of the the reason i'm telling you this story is that shukdev ji was also praising the effects of roop dhyan saying that through doing roop dhyan you can attain shri krishna this type of bhakti where you're actually meditating on the form of god it has a purifying effect that is the whole point of the spiritual path purify your mind we're made of three parts soul which is our true self body which is not our true self it's just a temporary ghar a temporary house for our soul to live in and mind mind is a little more subtle a little more difficult to understand about the mind than the body body is simple you say just like i live in a house i am not my house but i live in a house and i can change houses i can leave this house and go to another house same thing i live in this body and i leave this body i go to another body so i am the soul i am not the body that's pretty simple but the mind is much more subtle than this because the mind actually leaves the body with the soul when you leave your body you take your mind with you so actually you've had the same mind in every life that you've lived since eternity unlimited lifetimes you've had the same mind in every life but mind is not you you are the soul but you've had a mind and with that mind the soul is able to you are able to think feel experience decide remember the potential to do all of that is in the soul because the soul is alive but without the tool of the mind it's not able to put it into practice so the mind is a tool used by the soul but it's still separate from the soul the mind and the soul are together like if you have milk and you pour some water into the milk the water didn't become milk but it mixed in so you can't see the difference anymore so something like that the mind is in the soul we say in sanskrit it's adhyast it's mixed in or established in the soul but the main point i'm trying to get to is that it's the mind which is the decider and the doer actually although soul is the life source but it's with your mind that you perform all of your actions and it's the mind well the mind is either your best friend or your worst enemy because a polluted mind an impure mind is unable to recognize first of all that i am a soul the more impure our mind is the more difficult we find it even to accept such a simple fact and we only identify with the body and on top of that the the impure mind is unable to recognize the soul's deep original desire for god the mind can't recognize it it thinks it's just the desire to enjoy worldly things no the origin of that desire for happiness is the desire for god 
the more impure the mind is, it has more and more trouble accepting such things. So it can be your worst enemy or it can be your best friend. If we purify our mind and our mind is able to recognize that yes, I am a divine soul and I belong to Shri Krishna and only He is true happiness. So when I attain Him, then I'll be perfectly happy. The pure mind can accept this fact. Therefore, the only real thing we have to worry about is, is our mind getting purified? If our mind is not getting purified, it means our spiritual path is not effective. An effective spiritual path must purify the mind. You not only get that benefit that you're able to recognize your true self and your divine desire for God, but you get other benefits as well. As the mind purifies, all the daivi gunas, the godly qualities, start to manifest. They're developed. Like patience, determination, fearlessness, kindness, focus, energy, forgiveness, all of these qualities develop gradually as the mind purifies. And along with that, all of the negativities of the mind, the asuri gunas, they get reduced. So things like anger, jealousy, hatred, fear, all of these things start reducing. So really, when it comes down to it, if you could just find a way to purify your mind, that's it. That's all you have to do. You become a better person in this world and you move closer to your goal of God realization. So what's the most effective way of purifying the mind? The mind can be thought of as a cloth, like a piece of material. If you hadn't washed it in many, many years and it became caked with dirt, it was just filthy, that's like an impure mind. How, what's the best way to wash that? Have some 100% clean, pure water and have that water run over it. And as it runs over it, it gradually takes some of the dirt with it. And the more the water washes over it, the more the dirt comes out of your cloth. And the cleaner and cleaner it gets, eventually it becomes 100% pure. This is what we need to do with our mind. The Bhagavatam tells us a secret about this. Shri Krishna is telling Vishayan dhyaya tashchittam vishayeshu vishajjate mamanusmara tashchittam mayyeva praviliyate. He says that mind of yours that needs to be cleaned, if you attach it more in the world, you dwell upon worldly pleasures and attachments more. What happens? It becomes more engrossed in the world. But if you dwell upon me, how do you dwell upon him? Rup dhyan, how else? <laughs> Think about him, desire him, long for him. Think about your relationship with him, he's mine. That means your mind is getting washed by the pure water of Shri Krishna. Thinking of his leelas does the same thing. Chanting his name with the faith, with this feeling in your heart that he is in his name, that does the same thing. So Rup Dhyan has the power to purify the mind. It is the most effective way of purifying the mind. This is called Antarang Sadhana, internal practice of devotion. Is it possible to 
purify the mind through external practices of devotion? No. No more than it's possible to clean your mind by washing your body with soap. You can wash all day long. Your mind won't get purified by that soap and water on the outside. You need to get something pure on the inside. So we have to bring Shri Krishna into our heart. And the way to do that is Rup Dhyan. So regarding this type of internal devotion where we attach our mind to God, the Bhagavatam tells us, Dharma Satya Dayo Peto Vidya Va Tapasan Vita Mad Bhaktir Mad Bhaktir Shri Krishna is telling Uddhav about bhakti and he says, there is nothing as purifying as bhakti. He mentions two other things which are very great in the world. If someone follows all the rules of dharma, being a good person, what is your duty? What, are, what is your family duty? What is your social duty? What is your religious duty? And Satya Daya. While doing this, he maintains truthfulness and Daya, kindness, forgiveness, mercy. That's a great thing. And another great thing, Vidya, knowledge, true knowledge with tap, meaning renunciation and control of the senses. That's another great thing. But neither of those things, nasamyak, samyak means in full. Nasamyak prapunatihi. Prapunati means purify. Those things do not have the power to fully purify the mind. Mad bhaktya, only, my, only through my bhakti, Shri Krishna says, can the mind be fully purified. Bhakti punati manishtha shvapaka napisambhavat. He says, Uddhav, even the most fallen person, the most sinful person, can be purified quickly through such internal devotion to me. Even Shankaracharya, who is more famous for teaching about formless God, yet he also said, Shuddhayatihinantaratma Krishna padam bhoja bhakti mrite. He says the mind cannot be purified without devotion to the lotus feet of Shri Krishna. Exact words. So Rup Dhyan is a very special thing. And it's very easy to do because we have so many options. As I've been explaining to you the last couple of days, you can use any of your senses. So you try to see Shri Krishna in your mind. You can also use your sense of smell, taste, touch, hearing. Use all of your senses to sense Shri Krishna's presence with you. Maybe you're not a visual person, then use your other senses. Just feel him close. I also taught you that you can do viraha style, milan style, meaning milan in your meditation, your meeting with Shri Krishna. Or you can alternate and change it to viraha, where you're longing to meet Shri Krishna, you're waiting for him. So there's lots of options. But there's even more options. Bhagavatam says, Tasmat kena pupayena mana krishno niveshayet. Same thing Rupa Goswami says in Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu. Yena kena prakarena mana krishne niveshayet. Think of Shri Krishna, bring him into your mind any which way. 
So let's say you're thinking of Shri Krishna, you've made Mano Mai Shri Krishna in front of you, and then you think, okay, he's got that same ban mala on that he had yesterday. Let me change that. I'll put a new flower garland on him. You know what? That's a really big crown. I'm going to put a pagari on Shri Krishna today, wrap a cloth around his head and put his peacock feather in that. You can change his decorations any way you want. You can think of Shri Krishna any age from a baby to 16 years old. Scriptures tell us that Shri Krishna's normal form is as a 16 year old boy. But even if you want to think of him as an old man walking with a cane like your grandfather, Shri Krishna can be your grandfather. You have total freedom. Yena kena prakarena. Any which way. There's no right or wrong. Shri Kripaluji Maharaj said, you like playing cricket? And probably if you're like some cricket fans I know, they think of cricket a lot. So they might be trying to do Rup Dhyan on Shri Krishna and their mind goes to a cricket game. Shri Kripaluji Maharaj says, then put Shri Krishna in your cricket game. Give him a bat and bowl him. <laughs> Get him out. <laughs> Play cricket with Shri Krishna. There's, see, you can't, Shri Krishna cannot be affected by anything in this world nor by anything in your meditation. So you don't have to think, oh no, I can only meditate on very pure things. If Shri Krishna is there in your meditation, it is pure. He's purified your cricket game. So you have total freedom to think of him any way you want. Dress him any way you want. If Shri Krishna took avatar today in your house, for instance, he would have to go to school like the other boys. Do the other boys here wear dhoti and uh, shawl to go to school? No, they might have to wear suit and tie depending what school they go to or kurta pajama. They have to dress, Shri Krishna would also have to dress according to the times. So if you want to dress him in modern dress, go ahead. Dress him any way you want. Trinidad is so beautiful. Think of him in any scene, your favorite scene here in Trinidad. Some place on a hill, some place by the ocean, in your very own house. You have total freedom. As long as your mind is in Shri Krishna, your mind is getting purified so that water is running over and carrying away the dirt, cleaning out your mind. It's just a gradual process. Bhave smin klishya mana nam avidya kama karma bhi. Shravana smaranarhani karishyan nitike chana. Bhagavatam tells that why did Shri Krishna even take avatar? So that he could make his leelas known in the world and give us material to meditate on. That's it. Shravana smaranarhani. You hear the leela, then you do smaran of it. That's it. That's the main reason. <coughs> that he took avatar here. So we're going to do a little bit of kirtan right now. And what I would like to ask you to do is to do your own meditation with Shri Krishna. Make up your own leela if you want. Your own leela in your own house or somewhere outside, anywhere you want to be. You could also think of it in a more traditional way. Like... Think of a Leela of Bhagavatam or a Leela described by Surdas Ji or Shri Kripaluji Maharaj. Or you can just make up your own scene, your own Leela. It's totally up to you. When your mind wanders, just notice and bring it back. Because mind does wander. When it goes, it's going normally to the things we're attached to. So it's normal. Just accept that 
and bring it back to Shri Krishna or put Shri Krishna in that thing that you're attached to. Your mind goes to a person. Instead of struggling to bring your mind away from that person, keep thinking about that person, but see Shri Krishna in that person. That's also a perfectly valid way of doing Rup Dhyan. So let's spend a couple of minutes doing Rup Dhyan together along with a little bit of Kirtan. So we can all close our eyes and begin to do Rup Dhyan. Radhe Radhe Govinda 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 Radhe 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 Govinda Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe Radhe Govinda Radhe 
राधे राधे गोविंदा 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 राधे गोविंद राधे राधे गोविंदा 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 राधे 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 गोविंदा 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 राधे राधे गोविंद राधे राधे गोविंदा 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 राधे 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 गोविंदा 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 राधे 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 गोविंदा 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 बोलो लाडली लाल की The Bhagavatam is special for two main reasons. One, I explained to you about the bliss which is imbued in the Bhagavatam, which was enough to evoke the mind of Shukadev Ji Paramahans out of his divine samadhi. So great is the bliss of Shri Krishna's leelas, which is imbued in the Bhagavatam. 
In addition to that, the philosophy of the Bhagavatam is very special. In Sanatan Dharm, we have such a wealth of scriptures, but for one person to try to study all of that in one life is impossible. And even if you could study it, understanding it is another matter. Reconciling all the apparent contradictions between the different scriptures and even within one scripture, it's very difficult. Two of our most important scriptures are the Upanishads, which are part of the Vedas, and the Brahma Sutra, also called the Vedant, written by Veda Vyas. In the Bhagavatam, Veda Vyas Ji says, Arthoyam Brahma Sutranam Sarvo Mapi. He himself is the author of the Vedant. And after he wrote the Vedant, the Brahma Sutra, great big Vyakyas were written by great saints like Jagadguru Shankaracharya, Jagadguru Ramanujacharya, Jagadguru Nimbarkacharya, Jagadguru Madhvacharya, and also Vallabhacharya Ji. They all wrote long explanations of this Brahma Sutra. And there are many differences that appear in their explanations, in their bhashyas. Veda Vyasji says there's no need to go into any of those explanations. Arthoyam Brahma Sutranam. This Bhagavatam that I wrote is the explanation of the Brahma Sutra. I already gave the explanation right here. Not only that, Sarvo Panishadam Api. Api means also. Sarva means all. It's also the explanation of all of the Upanishads. So you want to understand what's in Vedas, what's in Upanishads, what is Vedant? Understand Bhagavatam. Shukdev ji says, Sarva Vedanta Saram hi Shri Bhagavata Mishyate Tadrasa Amrita Triptasya Nanyatrasya Drati Kvachit he says, what's the need to go into any other scripture? The sar of the whole Vedant, of all Upanishads and Brahma Sutra, the sar, the essence of that, has been put in the Bhagavatam, plus the ras is there. Ras means the, the nectar of the bliss of Sri Krishna's leelas. So why to go anywhere else? The third shloka of the Bhagavatam is... Nigama kalpataro galitam palam shukamukha damritadravasang yutam muhuraho rasika bhuvibhavuka pibat bhagavatam rasamalayam. The Bhagavatam is rasam alayam. Alay means home of or abode of. Just like we say himalay. Him means snow and ice. So the himalay is the abode of snow and ice. The rasam alay, the abode of ras, is the Bhagavatam. So pibat Bhagavatam. Shukadev ji says, just drink. That Bhagavatam. Drink the ras of the Bhagavatam. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Phal is fruit. So the ripe fruit of the Vedas. See, Ved tells that raso vai saha. God is ras. But that ras isn't imbued in the Vedas. So it's like saying Shri Krishna is divine love shri krishna is ras but how to get that ras you get that ras from the bhagavatam so the bhagavatam is the ripe fruit of the vedas so it's very special today i want to share a little bit more of the philosophy of bhagavatam just to illustrate to you how in explaining the, the Siddhant, the Bhagavatam 
just takes all the philosophies from the various scriptures and reconciles it into simple and powerful explanations. In the 11th canto, in the beginning of the 11th canto, there's a conversation that's told that happened between a great king, Nimi, and now Yogishwar, nine great yogic masters. God realized yogic saints. Nimi was also doing a yagya, and these no yogishwar came, and he asked them to be seated nicely on, a, on an elevated seat, and he started asking them questions. So in response to one of his questions, these yogishwar explained about the, to the whole situation of the soul in one shlok. Us, all of us, why are we here? Why are we in this world? Why can we, why are we failing to experience God? Our whole situation summed up in one shlok. Bhayam dvitiya bhiniveshatasya dishadapetasya viparyayo smriti Souls are turned away from God. Therefore, asmriti. The word that we use is vimuk. Your muk is your face. So your face and God's face are not facing each other. His face is facing you and your face is turned away. So we souls are vimuk. And what happens when you're vimuk? Well, if you're not turned towards God, what do you turn towards? Maya, the world. So then Maya has control of you. And Maya causes something very important to happen. Asmritihi. Maya makes you forget your true identity as a soul. And if you forget you're a soul, you forget that you belong to God. So if you don't believe yourself to be the soul, what do you believe yourself to be? The body? No other choice. Either you're the soul or the body. And once you believe yourself to be the body, what are you going to desire? Obviously happiness, but how are you going to look to fulfill that happiness? In the world. Then what happens? Then instead of doing smaran of Shri Krishna, you do smaran of the world. I need this thing. I want this thing. If I get that, I'll be happy. So what are you doing? Instead of bringing the nice clean water of Shri Krishna over your mind to wash it out, you're dunking your mind back in the mud of the world, of maya. The more you think about something, the more you desire something, the more attached you become to that thing. Then, according to your attachments, you're reborn. Then in the next life, you again do the same thing. You build more attachments. You further strengthen your faith that my happiness is in this world. I haven't gotten it yet. I didn't get it today, but I'll get it soon. We all have that faith. So the whole thing leads to a lot of suffering actually because once you're attached in the world, in this life also you suffer a lot. It's like being on a boat out in the ocean with no ballast, no anchor, no stability. You're just blown here and there. Whichever way the wind is blowing, whichever way the waves smash you, you go. When you're attached in the world, that's what life feels like sometimes. Because naturally in life, you're going to have ups and downs. Sarve chayanta nichaya patananta samuchraya. Everything in this world is temporary. Every meeting ends in separation. Life ends in death. Everything that you can hold on to will deteriorate 
and they will eventually end. So there's no, nothing stable that you can count on in this world. Not, not when looking at it from a spiritual point of view. Compared to God, who's permanent, perfect, absolute bliss, loves you unconditionally, compared to that, this world is very, very unstable. We are unstable. So whether you're counting on a thing or a person, it creates an instability in the life. Because we're so chanchal, our mind is so changeable. One day we want one thing, the next day we want the next thing. So when we're in relationships in this world with our relatives, with the people we love, when we expect happiness from them, that you should behave in a certain way to make me happy, it rarely works out because they have their own desires. They're also hoping for something from you. So we feel very unstable. Today I'm so happy because my son did this for me. Oh, he's so such a good boy, so loving. Then later in the same day, your son ignored you or did something that you weren't proud of. Now you feel miserable. Life is going to have ups and downs. It doesn't mean we have to have the same ups and downs in here. You have the choice of saying, okay, this person was nice to me. They behaved in a way that was favorable. That's good. Later on, they may behave unfavorable towards me. That's also fine. <laughs> both possibilities are there in the world. I have to accept both, not just possibilities, they will happen. And they happen in a cyclical way. One follows the other. You never only have good things happen to you with no bad things. And you never only have bad things happening with no good things. It's always a mix. Sure, you may have more or less depending on your past karma and what your prarabdh is in this life. But it's always a mix. But to have that perspective on life, you have to fix that original mistake. Someone, no one can have that healthy spiritual perspective on life if they believe themselves to be the body. How can you? If I am the body, then this world is mine. This person is mine and I have to find my happiness from this world. Because I am the body, so I am material. And this world is material, so it's going to make me happy. As long as you believe yourself to be the body, you can never fix this understanding. But as long as maya has control over us, how will you remember that you are the soul? And when is maya going to go away? When you turn towards God. So that's the cure, it's also the problem. The original problem is we're vimuk from God. We're turned away from Him. That started this whole problem. Like when you learn math, let's say you're solving a math problem, and when, when you're doing that, it may take you several lines to come to the answer. Like in simple algebra, when you're solving for x, you have to rearrange things and it takes you a few lines. What if you make a mistake in the first line? And then you further calculate in the second line according to that mistake. The mistake in the first line is compounded further in the second line. In other words, it becomes even more wrong. Then you go to the third line and you do further calculations based on the more wrong that you had in the second line, it becomes even more wrong. You keep going and going. That's what happens to, we're turned away from God, mistake number one. Then because of Maya, we forget who we are, mistake number two. We believe ourselves to be the body, then we get attached in, we look for happiness in the world, that causes us to get attached in the world then all the sufferings befall us. There's 
no escape at that point from suffering because we're so focused in on getting happiness from this world. And what is the world going to do? It's going to give us what it has, which is a mix of good and bad, always in limitations, never perfection. The world is going to give us what it has. And yet we're looking for perfection and we're bent on finding that perfection in this world so we're bound to be disappointed and we're bound to suffer and we're bound to be reborn again and again in this world because of our attachments. In the 12th canto of the Bhagavatam, there's a story of a great saint named Rishi Markandeya. Rishi Markandeya got the divine vision of Shri Krishna. And when Shri Krishna said, ask for something, I'll give you anything, he said, I want a vision of your Maya. Maya that produces the universe and makes us forget who we are. I want to get a vision of your Maya. I want to see it, understand what it is. So Shri Krishna said, okay, it will happen. But it didn't happen right then and there. Rishi Markandeya went back to his hut and his ashram in the jungle and went about his simple life. One day it started raining really hard, a huge storm. And it rained so much that the water was just flooding in from the four directions and getting higher and higher. And it covered everything until he was just floating in this ocean that had covered the earth. There was nothing more to be seen. There were these big giant whirlpools swirling here and there all over and he was alone in the world. There was no one else he could see and he was bobbing along on the surface of the ocean and the wind was battering him here and there and the waves were tossing him this way and that way and the storm raged on. Sometimes some aquatic creatures and some crocodiles would come and bite at him. Sometimes he'd get swept down in a whirlpool and he'd die but then he'd regain consciousness. Sometimes he was overtaken by feelings of grief. Sometimes he felt joy. Sometimes he felt anger. In this way, he went on for millions of years, living, dying, suffering, enjoying, getting tossed here and there. Finally, after millions of years, he sees this island on the horizon and he goes closer to it and he sees on this small island in the middle of this endless ocean, <coughs> there's a banyan tree, a vat vriksh, vriksh means a tree, vat is the banyan tree. So this young banyan tree growing on this island. And when he goes closer, he sees there's a huge leaf which is cupped kind of like this. And in the cup of that leaf, there's a beautiful blue baby lying there. Shri Krishna, Bal Mukund. So he went up close and he saw, oh baby, Krishna is lying there. He's reclining and in his hand, he's holding his foot and he's pulling his foot to his mouth and he's sucking on his big toe. So he had this vision of Shri Krishna and all of that suffering was gone. Everything disappeared and he was back to normal. So then he understood, okay, that's Maya. <laughs> and only when I got Shri Krishna, then I was free from Maya. So we've been drowning and regaining consciousness and drowning some more in this ocean of maya for uncountable lifetimes. There's no limit to it. See, one shouldn't think, okay, then when did I turn away from Shri Krishna? When did I become Vimukh? I must have been Sanmukh at some point and then I became Vimukh. No, because once you are Sanmukh, you can never become Vimukh. 
If you are with God, that is forever. This is a very important point. This is a point that is not explained anywhere except in our philosophy of Sanatan Dharma. And it's actually a little bit hard to grasp for some people because it's tied in with the concept of eternity and infinity which doesn't fit into our limited brains. So you're telling me I've never been with God? I've been turned away from God forever? Yes. Had you ever been with God, you could have never come under the bondage of Maya. You could have never forgotten about him. So just by virtue of this fact that today we are turned away from God, today we are under the bondage of Maya, it proves that we've always been. Because there's only two choices, either you're under the bondage of Maya or you're with God. And if you had been with God, you could never come under the bondage of Maya. <laughs> And you are an eternal soul. So it means if you're under Maya today, you've been under Maya since eternity, which means you must have been vimuk from God since eternity. It means we never even had a clean slate. Sometimes people say, okay, in my first birth, no, there's no first. <laughs> it's endless. It never began <laughs> like a circle. No beginning, no end. Okay, so when I did my first karm, no, there was never a first karm. Okay, so when I didn't have any attachment in this world, no, you've always been attached in the world. So that uh, whatever is our situation today, this minute is what it's been forever. Forever we've been turned away from God, believing ourselves to be this physical body, forgetting that we're the soul, forgetting that we're actually related to God, and looking with 100% faith towards this world to find happiness. That's how we've been forever. But the solution is simple. The solution is right in our hands. Just do rup dhyan. Keep thinking of God. Keep thinking of Shri Krishna, his leelas. The more you do that, when I say your mind gets purified, what that also means is that your mind is gradually turning towards Shri Krishna. It happens in percentages. It doesn't happen all at once. So if you did some devotion today, you increased your angle towards Shri Krishna. You're a little more towards him than you were yesterday. Keep practicing every day. You'll get closer and closer. When you become totally sanmuk, like the paras mani and the iron, when they touch, the iron becomes gold. So when you become 100% sanmuk to Shri Krishna, maya is gone instantly for you. Maya doesn't cease to exist, but the bondage of Maya is finished. And you meet him face to face. Bhidyate hridaya granthish chidyante sarvasanshaya chiyante chasya karmani drishta evatmanishvare Bhagavatam says, as soon as you see Shri Krishna, all of your past karma is gone. The knot of ignorance and confusion is finished, gone, loosened in your heart forever. And that's it. You become like Shri Krishna. You become equally blissful as him, equally knowledgeable as him. And all of this just happens through this gradual process of loving him through this rup dhyan, doing internal bhakti. So this is what the Bhagavatam tells us. You see, it makes everything, it takes all those philosophies and it brings them into one. But of course, even to understand Bhagavatam takes the help of a true God-realized spiritual master so whatever I'm explaining to you, whatever I have explained to you in the last three days, 
It's only what I've learned from Jagat Guru Shri Kripaluji Maharaj because even though Bhagavatam is the explanation of Brahma Sutra and Upanishads, but still it's not meant to be studied on your own. You can read the Leelas of the Bhagavatam and gain that benefit. But as far as studying the Siddhant, the actual philosophy of the Bhagavatam, that's not recommended for any scripture for a person to go and study it on his own. You need the help of someone. Sadguru Vaidya Vachan Vishwasa Sanjam Yah Navishaya Ki Asa Tulsidas Ji says, the true God-realized saint is like a Vaidya, like a doctor who prescribes the correct medicine according to your symptoms, who diagnoses according to your symptoms and tells you this is what's wrong and you need to treat, take this kind of treatment, follow this treatment plan. So we need someone who's actually one with God, who's attained God, to explain all of these intricate and nuanced spiritual matters to us. So whatever I've been able to share with you in the last few days is only due to the grace of Shri Kripaluji Maharaj. He has explained the Bhagavatam in his speeches and in his writings. So according to that, I've shared some, some of that philosophy with you. So now we understand that the philosophy of the Bhagavatam is great. Now hear one last story to that demonstrates that the Bhagavatam is on its own level due to the ras of the Bhagavatam. See, one time Narad Ji came after Kalyug had began, Shri Krishna had gone back to the divine world, leaving the earth planet. As soon as he left, Kalyug began. Sometime after that, Naraji said, let me go and see what's happening on earth. Let me see how Kalyug is progressing. So he went all around and he was amazed what he, at what he saw. Because it was still so early in Kalyug and things had gotten so bad. Kalyug actually lasts for 432,000 years. It's the shortest of the four yugas. Each one is multiples of Kalyug. Dwapar Yug, the one before Kalyug, is twice as long as Kalyug. Treta Yug, the one before that, is three times as long. And Satyug, the first Yug, is four times as long as Kalyug. So if you add them all up, it comes to 4,320,000 years to go around those four yugas once. Kali Yuga is only 432,000 years, like nothing. Now we're just, we've just begun Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga began in 3102 BCE. That's 5,117 years ago. Out of 432,000, again, it's like nothing. We've just begun Kali Yuga. So Naraji came and he saw, okay, it's the beginning of Kali Yuga and things have gotten so bad. Everywhere he went, he saw people becoming so selfish, so lazy, quarreling in the family, doing everything for money. Even... Spiritually speaking, he went to so many holy places and he saw that people are just trying to promote themselves and they're talking about God, but they're actually just having selfish motivation for their, for their religious looking actions. He said, it's, things are in a very bad state. Let me go and see what's happening in Vrindavan. He went to Vrindavan and although at that time things were better in Vrindavan, when he got there, he went near the bank of Yamuna River and he saw a beautiful young woman near the bank of Yamuna River and she had two old men lying near her. 
one lying this way, she had his head in her lap, and one lying this way with his head in her lap. And she looked very distressed. These two elderly men were, they looked like they were barely conscious. And all around her, there were many young devis, young maidens who were serving this beautiful young woman, fanning her or bringing things for her, taking care of her. And she was crying. So Naradji came close and he inquired that, uh, oh my lady, who are you and what's wrong? She said, Naradji, my name is Bhakti. She is Bhakti personified. My name is Bhakti and these are my two sons, Gyan and Vairagya. Gyan is knowledge and Vairagya is detachment. Gyan and Vairagya are the sons of Bhakti because they're produced through Bhakti. The more your mind gets attached to God, the more true knowledge dawns in the mind. Like, I am the soul. You start to actually know that, not intellectually, but experientially. Shri Krishna is everywhere. You start to experience that. So true knowledge comes through the experience of bhakti. And the more you experience that, the more you desire God and the less attached you are in the world. So detachment is also produced through bhakti. So knowledge and detachment personified are the sons of personified bhakti, but they were old. She said, Naradji, this Kalyug is so bad, actually all three of us were in this miserable state. But when I came to Vrindavan, I became young again. But my sons did not. They're still suffering. Naradji said, yes, this is the effect of Kalyug because in Kalyug, the spiritual path becomes so distorted. There are so many people teaching wrong things about God and about the path to God. So this is why you're suffering in this way and this is why your sons are suffering. Now you were revived coming to Vrindavan, but your sons have not been revived. So we have to think of something. So Naradji said, let me recite Vedas, Upanishads. He tried that. They kind of gained a little bit of energy, it looked like, but they still couldn't open their eyes. He recited Brahma Sutra, he recited Gita again and again. Still, even though they were able to sit up, open their eyes, but they were still very tired, no energy, and they went back into an unconscious state. He tried this many times, reciting all the various scriptures, but he was unsuccessful in reviving Gyan and Vairagya. He closed his eyes and he prayed to Shri Krishna that, what should I do? Shri Krishna told him, go to Badrika Ashram. You have to do a great good karm. What is that great good karm <laughs> that will revive Gyan and Vairagya? He couldn't find out. But he went to Badrika Ashram and while he was there, feeling frustrated that I can't figure it out, he again closed his eyes, prayed to Shri Krishna, and Sanakadik Paramahans came. Four Jnani saints, eternal Jnani saints who are also avatar of God. They came and asked Naraji, why the long face? So he explained the whole situation to them. They said, Naraji, this can only be resolved through reciting the Bhagavatam. Only the Bhagavatam can revive Gyan and Vairagya. So he said, okay, tell me what to do. They said, go to Haridwar. On the banks of Haridwar, you'll find one beautiful sandy bank. It's called Anandaghat. Go over there and make the preparations for a recitation of Bhagavatam. We'll come over there and tell Bhagavatam. So Naradji went and made all the preparations. 
Of course, there were already many saints living over there, but word spread far and wide. So many, many rishis, munis, saints, with their disciples, with their families, and even regular people, all of them came and gathered there. And in fact, even the other 17 Puranas in their divine form, and the Vedas in their divine form, they all came and sat, wanting to hear the Bhagavatam. So as soon as Sanakadik Paramahan started, they just started telling Bhagavat Mahatmya. They haven't even started Bhagavatam yet. They're telling the greatness of Bhagavatam like an introduction. Bhakti and Gyan and Vairagya came over there, appeared there in the midst of everybody. And Bhakti was already young, but Gyan and Vairagya also became young right there. And then they told the whole Bhagavatam, all the philosophy, all the leelas from beginning to end. And by the end, Bhakti, Gyan and Vairagya were dancing in joy. So only the Bhagavatam was able to accomplish this. You can say that just like in the divine world, there's different levels of divine attainment. You can attain formless God. You can attain Baikunt abode, which is above that where you meet God in person, but he's almighty. You don't get to partake in any of his leelas. Beyond that, you have Shri Krishna, who's not totally almighty, but slightly formal, like he is in Dwarika. So we say Dwarika Dhi Shri Krishna. More loving, you have Shri Krishna of Mathura. More loving than that, you have Shri Krishna of Golok and Vrindavan. So the various scriptures relate to these different levels of bliss as well. The other 17 Puranas, the Vedas, they relate to Baikunt abode, the almighty abode of Shri Krishna. Gita, slightly beyond that. That was told by Dwarikadhi Shri Krishna. But the Bhagavatam is related to Golok abode of Shri Krishna and it embodies the, the bliss of Golok abode. So that's why only Bhagavatam was able to arouse Shukadevji from his samadhi and only Bhagavatam was able to bring Jnana and Vairagya back to their youthful selves. So in this short time that we've had in the last three days, I've explained a little bit, giving you a few examples here and there of the Bhagavatam, its philosophy, and its leelas. I'll just share one more little janki of Sri Krishna's leelas as they're described in the Bhagavatam because it may help you in your rup dhyan. So it's told that when Sri Krishna was old enough to start crawling but of course Balaram was also there so they were all always a pair when they were old enough to start crawling so they would often do you know they're very innocent very naive little boys let's say they're out in the courtyard and you know Mother Yashoda and Rohini they're there to look after them, but they also have their household duties. They can't be watching them every second. So let's say they're out crawling around in the courtyard and maybe somebody goes walking by. So Balram and Krishna start crawling along behind them, just following a total stranger. And then all of a sudden, you know, the stranger may turn around and look and they say, whoa, I don't know him. Then they start crying and, you know, race as fast as they can on their hands and knees, come crawling back to Maya. And then Maya scoops them up and they're covered in dirt now. They've been crawling around. But the, it makes it look more like, a, like they're decorated with it, like it's smeared on them. It adds to their beauty. And she just hugs them and feeds them. When they're getting a little bit older and a little bit stronger, then they would do things like this. They're still not fully solid on their feet to walk, but they can get around pretty well. Let's say there's a calf just sleeping over there. 
Shri Krishna will crawl over to one calf, Balaram will crawl over to the other, get a hold of their tail. Once the calf wakes up, he'll say, hey, what's going on? And he'll start running and they won't let go. They still hold on and they're getting dragged everywhere here and there. <laughs> so Bhagavatam tells when the gopis saw this, they were like lot pot. They're rolling on, they, they're holding their bellies. They're laughing so hard, rolling on the ground. They were so enchanted by this vision of Krishna and Balaram doing this. Yashoda and Rohini had so much trouble concentrating on their household duties because Shri Krishna and Balaram became so active. You just turn your face for one second and they're going over here towards some peacock and they're worried, oh, the peacock shouldn't peck at them. Or on this side, they're going towards the fire. On this side, they're going towards some bush with thorns. Over here, there's water. They're just wandering. They're becoming too active. Now, when they were able to walk, then they started spending time with other boys of the same age. Shri Krishna just gives the maximum love with no seriousness, no restriction, no formality. So when they started roaming around the, the village, the neighborhood, then just like you like, you know, what do you appreciate in a child? You want to see the innocence, the beauty, but you also like some naughtiness, don't you? You wouldn't admit it to your own kids because you don't want to encourage them to be more like that. But when they're naughty, you get some enjoyment out of that, especially when they're young. So why is Sri Krishna coming here to do his leelas to attract our heart? So he's also doing exactly what would capture our heart. So in other words, he breaks the record in being innocent and naive. He breaks the record in being loving and playful. And he breaks the record in terms of being naughty. So they start roaming around the neighborhood and start sneaking into gopis' homes. Why? Imagine if you were a gopi living in that time, in that neighborhood of Braj, how would you feel if Shri Krishna came in your house and did some naughtiness? You would feel like, oh, he went to all the other houses and did naughtiness, he didn't come to my house? And then that day he came to your house, oh, he came to my house. So. Shri Krishna would go fulfilling the desires of the gopis. He would go in all the homes and do such mischief. Now the gopis were thinking that, you know, although he's doing this only to fulfill our desire, but wouldn't it be nice if we could go to Maya when he's there and we could complain about him and see if he become, how fearful does he become of Mother Yashoda when we're complaining about him. So let's go. So they go to Mother Yashoda and they say, Maya, we have some complaints about your boy. And Shri Krishna is hiding behind Maya, hiding himself in her anchal like that and peeking out at the gopis. When mother can't see him, he's making faces at them. And when mother's looking at him, he's just looking all innocent. In the beginning, but the more gopis talk, the more worried he's getting. Don't you know, mother? You think he's so innocent? But let me tell you what he did at my house. He came and, you know, we keep the calves tied up at a certain time of the day. We don't want them to go and drink all the milk of their mothers. Then how, when we go to milk them, what will happen? He comes, he unties the calves and says, go, go, drink milk. <laughs> And they go and drink all their mother's milk and we come to milk the cows and there's no milk for us. So how will we make curd? How will we make butter? What will we drink? Another gopi says, mother, that's not all. He came into my house. He took down one of the pots of curd. He was eating himself and then he fed all the monkeys. And when he was full and all the monkeys were full, you would think, okay, he stole some curd. That's bad enough, right? But when they were all full and they couldn't eat anymore, he picked up what was left and smashed the pot and left. Another gopi says, that's not all, mother. 
Now Krishna's starting to get worried. I might actually get in trouble here. You know, sometimes he comes in and he can't reach because we put the pot up so high. So he takes like a stool and puts another stool on top of it and maybe gets some help from his friends and stands up there and then he reaches and brings it down. And then they eat all of it. Now, sometimes if we put it so high that even using any kind of method, he can't reach it to bring it down, he'll use a stick and he'll poke a hole in it. And he'll say, oh no, that's not what I want. Let me see what's in this one. He'll poke a hole in that one or he'll throw a stone to crack it. So he breaks little holes in all of our pots and then everything just runs out on the floor and he leaves. If by chance he comes in our house and there's nothing to be had, he'll go quietly when we're busy somewhere else, he'll find the room where our child is sleeping and he'll pinch his cheek until he cries and then run out. So our child is crying now and we're disturbed from doing our housework. <laughs> so mother, are you going to do something about this behavior? Now Shri Krishna is really looking fearful, but when mother looked at his face, she couldn't even think of, never mind punishing him, she couldn't think of getting angry at him or even saying anything to him. So gopis got to see the vision of Shri Krishna cowering behind Maya, but Shri Krishna didn't get any kind of punishment. So that's just a little vision of these leelas of the Bhagavatam, which actually have been further expanded. If you read the leelas of Bhagavatam, it's in gist. You have like a little explanation of stealing butter, little explanation of going out and grazing the cows but saints rasic saints of Braj since that time 5000 years ago have expanded on those leelas because the leelas of Shri Krishna are anant hari anant hari katha ananta there's no end to his leelas so saints fill in the gaps Gargacharya, Shri Krishna's family's Purohit, he wrote Garga Sanghita that explains many more Leelas. Also, many Leelas with Radha, which are only secretly hidden in the Bhagavatam but not explicitly described. And of course, great saints like Surdas Ji and most recently, Jagadguru Shri Kripaluji Maharaj, revealing hundreds and thousands of beautiful Leelas of Radha Krishna, which are actually just the expansion of the Bhagavatam. So whatever leelas we have in the Bhagavatam and whatever bliss is in those leelas, the same bliss is in the leelas of the writings of these saints. So these also become the, the means of doing devotion. This becomes material for us to use to do devotion, to do rup dhyan. So with these words, I'll conclude my speech and do so with the hope that all of us can practice more devotion, do more sadhana every day and clean our heart and get closer to our goal of attaining Radha Krishna in this life. So we'll finish by doing some kirtan and after the kirtan we'll have the arti. Hari Hari Bo
राधे 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 वृंदावन में वृंदावन में राधे राधे वृंदावन में राधे परसाने में मनगढ़ में वृंदावन में बरसाने में राधा कुंड में प्रेम सरोवर गोवर्धन में प्रेम सरोवर वृंदावन में बरसाने में राधे 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 मनगढ़ में वृंदावन में प्रेम मंदिर में भक्ति मंदिर में भक्ति धाम में शाम शाम में राधे राधे कुसुम सरोवर पीरी पोखर गोवर्धन में प्रेम सरोवर राधा कुंड में वृंदावन में बरसाने में राधे राधे 
राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे राधे बोलो श्रीमद सदगुरु सरकार की अलबेली सरकार की जयके आरती जयति जगद गुरु गुरु वर की गाँव मिली आरती रसिक वर की गाँव गाँव मिली आरती रसिक वर गुरु पद नी चंद्रिका प्रकाश जाके उर बस काके मोह तमना जाके मानाथ का हाथ करवास काके हो माया मोह सब आरती प्रीतम प्यारी की की बनवारी आरती प्रीतम प्यारी की बनवारी Yeah. 
जगदगुरु श्री कृपालु जी महाराज की वृंदावन बिहारी लाल की राधा रानी की जय जय श्री राधे जय जय श्री राधे जय जय श्री राधे 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 सीताराम स्वामी निकलानंद जी डिवोटीज With deep honor and sincere gratitude, we would like to thank you, Swamiji, on behalf of all devotees, for giving of your time, knowledge, and experience in delivering three nights of Bhagavatam discourses. Swamiji, you have effortlessly integrated theory and practice of the essence of this holy scripture, and have given us devotees a practical insight on how to improve our everyday life. through rupdhyan swami ji you are a wonderful example of god's love at work thank you for teaching guiding inspiring and uplifting us most of all thank you for bringing us closer to radha krishna and guru may this be the first of many wonderful visits to our beautiful twin island of trinidad and tobago return to us soon swami ji devotees you are also welcome to take arti at the altar 
and receive prashad from Swamiji's own hands. Bojan has been prepared for all. Please partake before your journey home. Thank you. Sitaram Radhe Radhe.